Thank you, everyone. It's uh, great being back in Paris. I do actually love Paris. It's a fantastic place with a fantastic audience. Actually, I would say it's a delicious audience, if you know what I mean. That's actually what uh, Macron said to Malcolm Turnbull's wife in Australia. You have a delicious wife. Lost in translation, but that was a great moment. It was big in Australia. I don't know if it was big here. The videos disappeared on YouTube and uh, <laughs> the topic got forgotten. So today I will talk about drones, uh, a topic I worked on, let's say, for a year, um, over the past year, developing methodology, um, developing threats, threat modeling, etc. So I have a lot of content I wanted to share. So it goes fast, so switch to 64-bit, and uh, we will be fine, I guess. Just something about me, um, there's not much to say. I have titles and letters and acronyms, but that doesn't help you at all, so um, I will just go with that. I'm usually involved in everything that's information security, not just IT security, for that matter. Um, and usually, if it's very expensive, or very important, it's my turn. We will talk about drones today, um, from the drones themselves, and generally the work I do is usually, uh, I'm in the area of danger. Um, I'm not so much involved of the positive side of the drones, like um, delivering medication, <clears throat> delivering blood samples, <clears throat> dropping packets for uh, human disaster relief, etc. That's all fine, but I'm on the dark side of the drones. I'm talking about defense, I'm talking about attacks, I'm talking about threats, etc. So that you just a little bit understand this. It's like with the glass half full or half empty. My glass is broken on the floor, everything is spilled, a person is coming and slipping and is suing you. So that's my view of the world. Here we have in the topic of drones, and I urge you not to forget, we have two types of drones. We have the cooperative drones, the nice ones, the pilots that stay to the restrictions, the drones that don't fly when they shouldn't fly, and everyone is looking after themselves, and it's happily ever. If you would have more drone pilots like this, it's like similar in the IT world, we wouldn't need firewalls and antivirus because the people would be so brave. But there's the other side, my side. The non-cooperative drones, and usually when you talk about drones or the topic of drones, it's, uh, I will tell you later, where you typically get involved in that is smart cities, critical infrastructure, etc. You will have the non-cooperative drones. And it's similarly hard to explain to people what you have to do what do you have to stand up against for? How you have to build your security posture against this type of drones, or it's not just the drones, against this type of, let's say, uh, drone attacks. My frame of mind, I quickly highlighted that one. In this bit, or in the last year or so, which I've been involved with the drone topics, um, I'm playing defense. Allez les bleus, like on the world championship here. Um, like blue team, you can say in this way. Uh, but also I believe you need to develop some red team or attack capabilities in order to be a good blue team player. You need to understand, you need to try to predict, you need to be preemptive about it, and you need to know what capabilities are out there. What are you self um, competing against? What can hit you so that you can actually prepare an adequate defense? Usually, if you not just have uh, money, it's not an issue, you can build anything. You need to justify what defenses you are building. And in this perspective, the framework we will later look at will help you. Because you cannot use $50,000 for a drone defense system if you, the risk you're protecting is way smaller than $50,000, for instance. So, that's where I start. I do also <laughs> have high goals for you here, uh, actually. I would like you to take a couple of things with you. And especially what I really like is, the year I worked on this topic, 
prepared materials, risk analysis, did some testing, developed some basic KPIs around this topic, that you can take this further, that you can take this into your companies, or that you can start, instead of the usual pen testing, you can start pen testing in the direction of IoT, in the direction of drones. The drone itself is just a representation of what's coming in the future in the IT world. It's like autonomous vehicles. You will have the same problems there. For instance, one use case I usually bring to the table is, if Google Drive is bringing me to the hospital, you know, I call, they bring me there, emergency services, I get in. Then the car stops. Or for that matter, just any autonomous car. It doesn't have to be Google Drive. What do you do as the owner of the hospital? How do you have to pull the car away or not? There's no driver you can look for. There is no one there. There's maybe not even GPS reception at this location. So what do you do? Okay, first you need to write policies, as usual, paper. But after the paper, you need to do some action. Maybe there, you need to have new sensors or new signals telling that's not a zone for autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars or robots, for that matter. So what you will learn with the drones, you can apply to other areas in the future, where I believe is a lot of work involved for everyone, from technical to architectural to security. How did I come about the topic of drones? Um, or did the topic find actually me? Uh, the same will probably apply to you. So about a year ago, we had a critical infrastructure operator in the power area, utilities, coming to us. I work, by the way, for the largest uh, Switzerland telecommunication provider, majority government-owned. So, of course, where does the government come for work? To us. Um, critical infrastructure provider who was looking for solution to protect his infrastructure. That was the start. They didn't know where to go. Where do we go with this? Do we go to like the safety people who build the fences? Is it a, a cyber topic? Is it a general topic? So they came to us and I'm actually really glad. That was one of the starting points for talking about drones and drone risks. Then we had the e-health provider hospital. Uh, Switzerland has become a bit of a Silicon Valley for drones because uh, we have everything. We have snow, rain, mountains, lakes, high, highly densely populated areas, cities. But as uh, mostly important as well, our legislation is not that strict like in other places. In other places, it's completely, you know, when they sometimes uh, bring out a new law, it's totally over the top until it gets corrected again. We didn't, don't have to do this yet in Switzerland, so it's for startups quite attractive to test. But also we had startups talking to us and me. I mean, Texas is not the same as Switzerland in the mountains. So that's why they come to Switzerland to test. The e-health provider was actually, we have now two of these uh, projects running. They're transporting blood samples from one hospital to the other, over the air, in a city, populated area. It's very interesting. So there is also a point where you, from a security perspective, have to swoop in. And that's when it's about Patient Data Protection Act. So we have to, at all times, make sure that the integrity of the data concerning a patient needs to be, have integrity. What's happening there is the drones just transport these blood samples from A to B with no additional consideration, with, do, with no additional KPIs or audit points. What happens to these samples in the air has not been questioned yet. And the third one was specifically the government asked about drone capabilities in terms of what can they do, what threat they pose, etc. So we worked that out. Also, clearly you can see <clears throat> what's happening here is the topic is not quite clear. It's not quite sure where this topic show, should go and who should handle it. So it usually either falls between chairs and banks or it gets taken on by someone. Here I give you actually the summary uh, of today. That will be your worst enemy, innovation in this regard. 
and you need to prepare yourself to handle it. We did have a lot of talks to, to startups, uh, companies setting drones, uh, using drones, industrial drones, uh, fire brigade, the police using it, etc. But always where you struggle most is innovation. Because you go there and say, yeah, that's this and this risk, it's a populated area, you could lose data, it's sensitive, you know, all these things, it could be hacked, etc. But I say, yeah, it's new. We want to be the first ones. We need to get this through. And as usually with security, they just see you as a roadblock. So either you become a big roadblock, or you need to find ways around this. But I will tell you, if you get involved, risk, security, innovation will be along your way, and you have to deal with that one. Especially here, I can just tell you, uh, there's a topic which is called predictive maintenance. I don't know if you have heard of, but that's the holy grail of production where you try to predict and then just do maintenance based on that. Instead of bringing your car in at 30,000 kilometers and at 60,000 kilometers, you will use predictive maintenance to bring it maybe at 40,000 and then at 80,000. That's what's done with the F-16 fighter jet planes in the US, and that will be done to a lot of defense vehicles, I say so, in the future. Why are drones an infosec topic? Um, it's all about data. It's all about location, where the data is, what you transport. It's all about the space and the area. So it's the third dimension. It's just like you build wings on a firewall and up it in the air. It's the same thing. So this is a very, very much an infosec topic. But also I think it's important for everyone to realize it's like in soccer, you need to offer yourself. You need to offer your services for maybe pen testing IoT, maybe do some analysis of the drones, maybe look at the processes, maybe writing policies for drone transportation, make, make sure that healthcare has been included, checking in with critical infrastructure providers. So it's for both sides, you know, the, the, the operators or the drone innovators don't know where to go, but also from an infosec perspective, you have to offer yourself because you have, I hope so, after the session, a deeper understanding about the topic and the risks. Like in soccer, offer yourself to those companies. Develop new services for pen testing or develop the capabilities for your critical infrastructure you may operate in. <clears throat> It's definitely an infosec topic. Um, also, definitely here, uh, we do this anyway in Switzerland at the telco provider. Physical security and information or IT security has come together. So we have people which are in the shops and we have, uh, let's say, the infosec guys who work together. What's happening there? What is, uh, for instance, physical security in the shops? We talk about robbery in the same meeting as infosec in terms of uh, switching off location services so no one can see where the repair centers are and all these sorts of things. Maybe you discover the same. These worlds are merging. And I think with the new technologies like drones, autonomous vehicles, even more so. So it's like a, a sci-fis. It's a new discipline, cyber-physical. You see that in the area of SCADA much better because SCADA has a more of a direct impact in, in the physical world as other components. Here we'll give you some uh, really basics about uh, the drones. If you work with drones and the topic of drones, it's all about the lingo of the dingo. You need to know what you're talking about. And just to give you some facts, and maybe already things we figured out is quite hard for people to fathom. So a drone, uh, zero to 100, three seconds, it beats every sports car in this regard. Braking takes about five meters to stop. Um, maximum speed, and that's maybe changing weekly, is 185 kilometers. It's not just like these little lame white things you see flying around. They're really fast. Altitude is also a discussion. You know, you say, yeah, they don't fly that high. Well, there's a record of 3,700 meters with one of those ones. It can have up to 45 minutes. Usually it's probably around 20. Uh, payload, always a discussion. Up to a person, 
there was a person hanging on a drone. Okay, it was a bit bigger, of course, and he was jumping with the parachute. Then often the discussion is the reach. <laughs> People talk in this in these risk scenarios about reach. They they talk about remote control, and have this in mind. It's like a plane. You steer with the remote control, and then yeah, is it one kilometer? Is it two kilometers? But forget discussion about distance. I can be sitting in Central Park with my phone, and I can fly a drone in Paris if someone opens the box for me. So there is no discussion about, in my mind, of course, always, there's no discussion about distance and controlling a drone. This is long gone. There's not maybe a pilot standing on the corner. Maybe there is. But forget from a risk perspective, distance. Distance is everywhere. You go over the mobile network to fly a drone from everywhere in the world. Costs a couple of hundreds to twenty thousand dollars. A specific one, uh, for instance, with uh, cameras for the fire brigade, infrared cameras, etc. Uh, and also, they're using navigation systems like GPS for their positioning. Some of them. So we need to know a bit about communication, uh, the uh, area of communication, maybe the frequency they use, signals, aerodynamics, and a bit of physics. Then regulation, I put together a slide for you. It's also thought as handouts for yourself. Take it home and uh, look at it. Uh, there's a lot of like, regulation out there. It's also changing on a monthly basis. Everyone is going towards the European regulation. Um, <clears throat> but regulation never stopped crime. You always have to think about this one. It's cool, regulation. You have to follow it, look at it. Uh, but as a matter of fact, you have to build your own defense around this topic. Here are the links. Um, for this one. And usually people are looking at the police. Um, yeah, that's right. It would be actually a police, uh, a police job if there's a problem with privacy or trespassing. But you can call them. They might come. When they are here, your drone is gone. So there's no point in uh, emphasizing on this. This is the map of Paris, your flight map. I'm really sorry for you guys. It's all red, no fly zones, pretty boring. But as I told you, regulation never stopped the crime. Um, very well, there's a map. It's usually in, in all the countries. There's a map showing where you can fly, where you can't fly, with uh, height limits or weight limits, for that matter. And there are just a couple of spots in, in Paris. Um, I wonder how a, a hospital scenario would work here in France, but maybe then they would just get the exception for handling such cases, I guess. The other side, which is really nice with these maps is, it's for open source intelligence. Um, there's a lot of intelligence in those maps. The usual flight maps are one to 300,000. The ICAO maps, where they show you the air pathways and the landing zones, CTR zones, where the airports are. But the drone maps are much better, because on the drone maps, Every little airport is there. And you might wonder, I was looking in Switzerland, you see the military airports, you know, usually it's a big drama around them, where are they, and you can't tell, and they have secret names for them, and blah, blah. And then on the drone map, you see a red circle around them, and well, I guess then you know where the stuff is. I looked a bit around Paris, there's also an interesting place, just more up to the east where there was a red circle in the middle of nowhere. I thought, ah, oh, well, let's have a look at it. First, I was thinking it's a cemetery. Usually, it's no-fly zones over cemeteries, but it wasn't. It was just in an open field. I was looking at it, then opened Google Maps, places, looked at companies in this area, and there was some type of specific company doing uh, some kind of helicopter engines. I mean, I would never have found that without these nice drone restriction maps. So don't forget, it's, a good, uh, it's also a good piece for open source intelligence. Topic itself is a fat topic, what I say. Uh, it looks like um, it, it's actually fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's a bit of a circus. Um, it's a low maturity topic in regards to what you can do against it, in regards to what informations are out there. As I told you before, it's an innovation topic that makes it even a bit more worse for risk people. 
uh, or people have to protect themselves, and it's a startup mentality. So if you work there, there are everywhere startups, you will get in contact with them, uh, they will tell you anything. Um, so it's a bit uh, like the age of uh, gurus and prophets in this regard, and it's, it's sometimes hard to work in there. I also did a bit of startup work in there with, with one of our products, get involved with brilliant people, open-minded, dynamic, you know, fresh, new, everything is better, which is coming, and uh, I tell you, it started there, I said, yeah, you can you upload your risk map assessment uh, for the government to, I don't know, whatever system this was called, some online in the cloud related canvas management tool, and then about a week later, I got another tool and say, yeah, look at this one, we had this startup and we created a common working area with those ones in the cloud. I said, hey guys, <laughs> time out, that's wrong. You know, we are, we are security, information security. We are the guys who make, uh, you know, uh, data classification and stuff. And this world here where everything is open, you find everything, all the information out there in clouds and SharePoints and canvases, it's a world that collides with each other. So keep that in mind. Um, then this leads to this. Why testing? It's really, from my experience, especially with new topics, with a lot of innovation, with a lot of startup, do some testing. Because you almost get promised everything. So you really need to look under the hood. And we did that. We did uh, commission some uh, drone defense systems. At the beginning, they're fantastic, and on paper, they look awesome. Uh, but in real life, it's a different story. And I can tell you here right now, none of these drone defense systems work 100%. And for the rest, you need to think for yourself what's acceptable as a risk that's left or what's not acceptable. Some of these systems are based on different uh, technologies. Some of the systems will detect uh, birds for drones. Uh, some of them will detect, uh, and there's actually a lot, trucks with cooling system and vents on their roofs or in the, in the cabin. It's, so it really depends. Some systems are actually very good at detecting some sort of drones and can even stop them, uh, but they completely miss other ones. So, for that matter, it depends on the criticality of, of your infrastructure or your event or place. Really do, do some testing. I can highly recommend that. So, after all this, we decided, uh, getting into that topic for the last year, this is a fat topic. There is not much to go on on this. Uh, we need to create structure. We need to create structure and method to assess risk and do some effective testing on what's working and what's really the risk with these drones. It's getting hyped from, I don't know, people getting uh, hijacked or whatever with drones, but also you have to determine if it's a real threat, and also you have to come up with like a, a model for actually getting the money if you want to build defense. No one will just throw, you money, just throw money at you and say build something. You need to build on a purpose, or you need to kind of match up why you're building these type of things. So since there were no standards, we started doing that our own. We first developed a, a catalog, uh, what's out there, what has been reported, what really has been a, a, a case in drone. Um, then secondly, we built, after the catalog, the drone threats and countermeasures, categorized them, and then also we added like uh, to the categories themselves additional criteria to see what's really feasible solutions for drone detection. But I will walk you quickly through that one. You get this as handouts, so I won't iterate uh, on every bit of it. That's the thread catalog. It contains 140 items in there. Some of them are you know, the, the typical ones, like payload, you know. Um, they are also espionage, industrial espionage. You can use it for that. Um, carrying laser microphones. You can also do droppings. Sounds a bit strange, but I actually use it more in this way for social engineering, because a memory stick dropped inside a nuclear plant on the parking lot is so much better 
than dropping the memory stick outside that facility. If you as a person um, going somewhere, living somewhere, you enter these facilities, you hand over your phone, blah, blah, your uh, identification card, you go in there, you usually never look up. You forget about this. There is a three meter high NATO fence with a three meter divider where the dogs are, another fence in there, and you feel somehow inherently safe in there. You feel, I'm in a protected facility. Yes, you are in a way, but with drones, you can forget it. With a drone, I'm in the third dimension. I can drop anything anywhere. Access point, repeaters, memory sticks, trackers, etc. whatever you like. Here, for some other risks, like um, more into the IoT hacking, hacking of uh, uh, medical equipment of persons which are relying, because you now can have access there. You have access to the rooftop apartment. You have access also to the rooftop apartment and the art is there. If someone has a, a very expensive statue in his rooftop apartment, you can go and steal it with the drone. It's very easy. You can go and steal the phones, purse, the dog, whatever you like. So that's just a bit of uh, the drone risk from these 140 risks we uh, compiled together. Then out of these risks, we do have to make categories because in terms of, if I go to a critical infrastructure, I need to know what the categories could be that can be potentially a threat to my critical infrastructure. Like for instance, I told you the utilities, European wide power distribution. If that grid is going down, then we have a problem not only in Switzerland, it's a major problem. And if you know how difficult it is to recover from a black start, and you even having a black start capability, black start means you have a complete blackout in a country, and then for instance, uh, that's not classified or so, in Switzerland, there are only 10 facilities available who can start themselves without power. Everything else needs power to restart themselves. And that's quite interesting. So it's very hard to recover from a, from a blackout when you have to do a black start. So we have here the categories, the payload. I will show you more about that one. Signal hacking is a whole category of uh, threats we have with the drone, privacy intrusion, of course. Uh, we hack, we hack building management systems, for instance. We have easier access to them. We attack uh, communication masts. We have 6,000 of them in Switzerland. Inside the threat, working together, exchanging information, intrusion trespassing. CDO is a civil disobedience. If you know, for instance, um, you have demonstrations and the demonstrators themselves are using drones to make pictures, which could be problematic later on. Kinetic attacks, the drone itself has a weapon, as I told you, 180 kilometers per hour. That makes a big dent in your car and in your head too. Um, also, there were people flying their drones into gaziers or people who were chasing animals with the drones. So they you know, damaging uh, wildlife and also plants, for instance. Surveillance, of course, you can survey with it. It's an espionage tool and economic attacks. Economic attacks is more around uh, that you bind resources, police, for instance, with drones which are very cheap. So you generate a disproportionate response to one drone. You know, one $200 drone, if I send maybe here in Paris, it's a bad example, uh, there's high security here, but if you send up 100 drones, you will have 100 incidents where in some way or form, people have to respond to these 100 incidents, of course. So that's this kind of economic attack I'm alluding to. Then as a subcategory, um, it's more in the AC laboratory, where, for instance, Switzerland was involved in the UK poisoning case. For them, it's different. They speak this type of language. It's the CBR NNE threats, and they're particularly interested what you can do with drones based on that one. I will show you that later as well. Of course, you have payload with the drone. Depending on the drone, you can add up to a kilogram very easily. If the drone gets bigger, four, 10 kilos is also very easy. Uh, in terms of uh, explosive, 10 kilo is uh, humongous. In terms of explosive, uh, 100 grams or 200 grams is very, 
very much. It's a lot. You can blow up. Of course, biological, um, radiological, nuclear, and biometric, uh, uh, narcotics and explosives for transporting or dropping. Then the countermeasures, what can you actually do against it? We spend a lot of time there. What, what can you do? There is active and there's passive, of course, with all these things. Missile, that would be a disproportionate response. Works perfectly well, is 100% accurate, is a bit expensive, 1.5 million. Um, and we have collateral damage, so it's more something for the military. Um, the other ones work as well. Birds, France started first with that one. We have it now in Geneva, seems to coming like from the French speaking area, these birds. After a while they have enough. <laughs> you know, you cannot train them to catch 50 drones a day. It's a nice way of catching them and it's ecological, but it's not very efficient. And to be honest, in a stadium, in a sports stadium, if you have to have 20 birds, you have to feed them, you need like an animal keeper. So it's good and you, you see also with that one as defense, it's, it, Topic is not very far <laughs> if you're looking at birds for defense, but it's cool. EMP, of course, um, electromagnetic impulse, projectiles. I don't have included anything of that sort, of ballistic sort, but uh, I can make it short. Uh, you cannot shoot it down. You will hit it, the drone, no problem, up to 900 yards easily. Even my daughter would hit it. It's a small target. But the problem is uh, the collateral damage around it. Because it's so small and the energy of bullets are so high, they will penetrate. The drone won't fly, but the bullet lands in the next building. Or the bullet just overshoots and goes there. Yeah, you can maybe use rubber bullets, but it's not really a defense technology, an efficient one. Then you have payload. You drop something yourself on the drone. You can try to hack into the communication between the remote control and the drone. If it's a remote control, I know that I told you before, it's going over the mobile network, for instance, or if it's just programmed with waypoints. Jamming, that's actually perfect, but it's uh, regulated by the FCC, and only police can do it, in certain cases, the military. So in Davos, at the WEF, there were three teams with different jamming technology. Looks like a rifle, but it sends out signals, uh, broadband, or just uh, targeted to the communication band of the drone, and will take it down. It's nice, but it's not allowed for civilians. It's not allowed for a critical infrastructure operator, for a nuclear plant, or whatever you have. Geofencing is built in in some of the drones. Some of the drones can't start if they are within a certain area of an airport, but you can take that out. There's a lot of catching around with nets, drones flying around with a net, or you have little guns shooting up a net, there's the distance is a bit the problem. Uh, it works up to 50 meters maybe, or a bit more. But to be honest, uh, what we said before, 180 kilometers per hour, and you want to shoot a net at it. You might try, it doesn't work. No-fly zones is more of an administrative uh, measure, and uh, shutters as a drone defense system linked with building management has been done. Uh, more in the Arabian area, so when a drone approaches, it closes at least the shutters of your building, so you have no sight into the rooms, for instance. And, uh, of course, you can always use collision. That's maybe something you could use as a private one as well, uh, within certain areas that you just use a kamikaze drone and get the other one down. Out of this, we built the threat radar. Radar is more of a consulting management tool where you actually place those risks. That's the one you can use straight off, like here it is. You have drone threats, uh, the development of those threats, how they will develop in the future. If it's a topic, you need to look into that quickly. Or if it's a topic, you can look later at it. It's risk over time. The threat radar is general, and usually you build one of those either for an event, like a big festival or movie festival, or so, or you can build a threat radar for a location, a critical infrastructure location, what we did. We took a critical infrastructure and made this assessment based on the risks you saw before. But uh, I will show you some uh, payload examples. What I told you before, we do test. Um, it's our test fight drone. Um, here is to say that's a, a Phantom 2 Vision Plus, or it kind of was. 
in some sort. Um, also, there's remote dropping capability with this device attached to it, but also there are other devices you can just drop, they just pull a pin and you can hang on there whatever you want. Um, if you work in a, more in direction of anti-terror or national security, uh, you have to pay special attention to this type of drone. Not that one up here, but to this type. Phantom 2 Vision Plus, and that's because of the flight controller software. It's the one that gets most easily hacked. So if you have like excessive buying of that drone, it would either be me testing the stuff, or it would be someone else which has maybe not that good intentions. Then payload, here is more payload, a couple of examples. Um, you can transport just about anything you want. Uh, on the left, there's a bit of chemicals you can use. Uh, I also tested uh, how they disperse in the air, how does it look like. Uh, I'm a beekeeper, and there is some fantastic chemicals available for the bees. Uh, so, and all that stuff is so easily available. But let's have a little look. Let's go to the next one. So, I brought you a little video since I didn't thought it was appropriate to bring the drone in here. That's the one with the payload device. Um, here is just some <clears throat> pictures of the flight. It's uh, easily, also from a skill level, that drone, anyone in here can fly it. It's not a problem. Very easy, stabilized. Um, here is some uh, example of memory stick dumping. As I told you before, it's so much better to dump a stick somewhere inside the perimeter than outside. Very easy. Rele release mechanism is a remote control. It's just a button. Most difficult part here was actually try to film and fly at the same time, since I don't have a crew with me. <laughs> here is, um, was that one? Yeah, I was just dropping a little chalk and see how, it's, how it works and uh, looking at the height for dropping it. Um, there's other examples. That's a nice little concrete block because I was just doing some construction work at home. Uh, it's about 90 grams. And if you have some physicists, they can uh, just actually calculate that, what that would mean. If it drops on your head, it hurts. That's what I can say. Um, then anything, put on balloons, flowers, washing powder, rice, whatever was available. But it was just also to see how it, uh, how it works and how accurate you can be with that one. And uh, dropping payload at the beginning, I mean, flying is not a problem at all. And uh, accuracy is also very, very, very easy. That one was just used to try to extinguish the fire. It didn't work. Maybe it just blew up the fire more because it was flour. You heard of that, male explosion. And that was my, my uh, use case for uh, dropping uh, biological or chemical agents. Very easy. Also, to the draft of the rotor blades, it gets pushed down. So. And I intentionally also only used what's, what's available in a normal household. You know, I don't want to go and buy uh, some specific equipment for that, except the little bomb device you saw. But the rest gives you a feeling of what's possible, what could, could come to you, and uh, what could be one of the problems you have. So I need to speed up, otherwise I get wrestled down from the stage. Let's go quickly through here. That's the bomb then, yeah. I got up higher and higher and higher. Um, I actually was a bit close to the cars since I tested at home. But that one just flies perfectly, stable, and uh, did the job it's supposed to do. And also, since I was close to home, I, I didn't use any explosives, otherwise probably my house wouldn't be standing anymore. <laughs> you, you, you used to get dragged away when you do testing like that. You forget your environment. <laughs> so let's go ahead. Here's another one you need to consider. It's the primary and secondary effect of drone and what you can do with the drone. It's not just that you do some damages with it, but also uh, people's reactions to it. If you go at a certain place, populated places like stadium, etc., you drop some of this, what I showed you just before, people maybe get panicked, and it's not even uh, a threat based on the drone, it's what we call a secondary effect of the drone. 
So keep that in mind too. Here I go quickly through the methods we have seen for uh, the assessment. We assess them against criteria like cost, legality, public acceptance, uh, effectiveness. Uh, missile is quite effective, but is publicly not really accepted in the city. So we made this whole table for you, and you see which are the favorites, um, which got the most points, obviously. But the ones which got the most points, like jamming, would be nice. A drone, when it's, the drone is jammed, it usually goes home, or it just goes down. It doesn't drop or something, but you can't do that, except if you're police. So you need to look for other ways. EMP would be nice too, it's a bit difficult and not everyone has birds. So what you're left with is basically this, cyber shutter and geofencing. And most of the solutions you see are in the area of cyber drone defense solutions. So they detect, so you can also then uh, try to get the perpetrator flying the drone. Um, Drone detection is not defense. Here are pictures from uh, our office in uh, Zurich and Bern. We used drone defense technology. Actually, go one step further, we used IoT gateways, put the software and the drone defense sensors in the cloud, and then we could, do, we could monitor two sensors at complete separate locations, in, basically in one software, and see what's going on at this location. That was kind of the CEO's office there. We just hijacked it. So that's how a report looks like. A detection log shows you the drone, where it is, how long flight time was, what type of protocol. Oh, I didn't have this. Uh, there's also another pro protocol available where you can actually uh, see the digital fingerprint of a drone for later. So you see uh, one demonstrator or civil disobedience happening in one city. If that guy reappears in another city, you know it's the same drone. Maybe it's not a guy, maybe it's a girl. Here we did some manual forensics about no-fly zones. Um, this photo was publicly available from the angle and so on. We suspect that it was a picture taken by a drone where it shouldn't be taken uh, because this person is looking up and from the angle. We looked at then at the location um, where the photo was taken. Either it had to be taken, there's one of these uh, laser beamies from up here, which was unlikely, or then what we suspected has been taken by a drone. And the only thing uh, for me left was I wouldn't need to have the drone so I could look at the picture and exit them and see if it really was taken there. But that was, that was more like you know, a test because I don't care about um, some journalists taking pictures of, of demonstrations. Then testing is dangerous. That was my car. I was lucky. It would be more dangerous. It would be my wife's. Um, and expensive, you need props, you need drones, etc. Uh, here actually, uh, there on a the car are two windows, you know, at the back. At the, this was the window at the back. So, and one is with antenna and one is without antenna. Guess which one I hit? The one with antenna, of course. It was around 300 bucks to replace it, and embarrassing. So beware, you may look away about the next picture, but if you have seen Game of Thrones, it's not a problem for you. Fish gills, and there is a thing as a typical drone injury. And it looks like that. The picture is only black and white. But that's a racing drone. This one only flies about 140 kilometers per hour. You fly it FPV with the camera. But that bloody bugger hit me bad. I was flying, testing, of course, and uh, struggling, falling backwards. And then I stepped on a stone. I thought, oh, yeah, that was from the stone. And then looked at it. And uh, it was actually, these props hit me. So don't underestimate what props can do to you. They cut pretty bad, so I was upping safety, of course, since I'm a safety conscious person. Never ever do this. We had drones landing on our data centers. No one knew where they came from. No one knew what they were doing there. Just on top of the data centers, if they were just curious, we could also not uh, identify the persons flying them because there's no registration. Um, it's not mandatory, it's not compulsory now. So never ever touch these things. You have to disconnect or use a towel. Just throw a towel over it and, uh, or use some very good gloves. And you saw the cuts from before. I'm not kidding you. That thing will cut off your uh, finger. So now I have a little movie for that. Um, if you please play it. Think about 
quickly about uh, four questions. I have four little drones for you for each question. I actually had five. I tested with the fifth one, but they're not really, uh, how you sell, they're not really dangerous. Um, so I can give them away before they collect more dust. Except if you swallow them, then they are maybe uh, dangerous. Um, <clears throat> so here's a little test. Just to remind you, uh, the drone just itself, what the threat it poses to you. There was a sure de legume at home. And I told my wife I will help you with that one. Because after that, I caught myself, I was really curious what particular problems you have and what can be done against it. You will see that one with both drones. So, since I'm running out of time and before I get wrestled down, does someone have a question right now? You can still enjoy watching watching the, the video. Maybe we need a mic or you can just tell me. <laughs> yes, you please, and then maybe you. Yeah, the noise, noise. That's the one you hear, it depends on the drone and how far away it is. But also, let's say for the DJI Mavic Pro, the uh, noise reduction propellers. And they really lower the noise, I think, about five decibels. And those ones are not really new, They're especially in a city, you won't hear it. And then if you really want to use it as a spy tool, you actually drop it somewhere, your drone. And then you let it stand there in standby and use the camera and the microphones, I guess, so. <laughs> you had the question, you think, here? Uh, have you released some tests about uh, GPS or GSM to, to hijack the drone or to, 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 make, uh, to make it... Um, Land. Land. Mm. Yeah, that some of the drone defense solution sensors are using that. They try to imply a patch. It's not like a root patch, but also they try to send the drone a very short signal with the offset, basically. And you have a very short time frame where usually you, when you're sending signals about GPS, it's much stronger here on Earth than the, the signals from the sky. And then you have a small uh, window of opportunity where you can actually try to hijack these signals, change them, and so maneuver the drone to another place. That's what some Israeli sensor technologies uh, are doing right now. We will test them next week. I can tell you the results. <laughs> Who added? Hello, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, about drone detection, uh, you showed us Drone detection based on radio uh, radio detection from your office, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I I understand it only works with uh, uh, remote controlled drones. What about fully automate, uh, autonomous drone? Uh, have you studied some other method method of detection like uh, electric? Radio, come on, I would say, uh, yeah. um, it's um, elect electronic uh, emission or sound detection, something like this. Yeah, some of the solutions have sound detection as well. The problem is drone defense sensors just listening at 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz. Yes. So if you have other drones flying or with old let's say, um, flying technology or not the quartz, you wouldn't see them, or also if they fly waypoints. So there is, with one of the sensors um, manufacturers, you have a microphone and a camera. So you detect them visually and by sound as well to get those ones. And how far can you detect? How far? One to two kilometers. Depends, in the city it's a bit less. Thank you. We'll give you that one. 
<laughs> is there another one? Was there another one? Yeah. Okay. Then thank you very much for having you. I'm here the next two days, so please grab me uh, before I'm gone and uh, ask your questions. Thank you very much.